there. It, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do, I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much has nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Now, I know your bulletin says uh, Chris Bartika is preaching, but I am not Chris Bartika, but I am a Chris. So uh, please have grace on me, and um, if you would, please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, uh, please help me in this time to deliver this word as you had intended it. May this be a time to reflect on your goodness and your grace and all that you have done for us, how you have saved us, and how we were lost and have been found. May we listen to this call that the church would live in such a way that our hopes are not in the things of this world, but our hope is in you and in your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today we will be looking at 2 Corinthians. Um, the inspired Apostle Paul wrote many letters in the New Testament, and this is one of them. Reading through Corinthians, we see that Paul cared deeply for this church, for these people in Corinth. He spent some time there uh, planning the church. He was discipling them, teaching them, um, teaching them all about Christ, all about what, had, what God had done through Christ. Um, but... As he had moved on, false teachers had come in and infiltrated this Corinthian church and tried to teach another gospel. And they really threw Paul under the bus and said that he was just a huckster and um, they had really swayed the allegiance of these people away from Paul but away from what the true gospel was. So Paul is writing these letters, first and second Corinthians, but uh, second Corinthians, Paul's having to defend his apostleship, and he writes uh, explaining how he's been suffering uh, and his worry over them, still a pastor to them, and, and he worries for them. So with much uh, pastoral grace and tact, Paul wants their acceptance and their love, and he continues to encourage that the gospel that he had preached was true and that they should continue in that faith. So we come out uh, to chapter 8. And 8 and 9 is really about giving, but uh, it stood out to me as, as not only a message for the church, but also for me, myself. I need this sermon as much as anyone else. I am not a natural giver, and uh, I would say that no one is a natural giver like, like this. But uh, prayerfully, we will see that the Church of Christ is committed to gracious giving that is ultimately God working through his people. Uh, my big idea, uh, we don't have a PowerPoint, so if we did, the big idea would be up there, but it's this. Those who have received the generosity of God's grace extend grace generously. Those who have received the generosity of God's grace extend that grace generously. And I have four points based on the question of how do we extend grace generously? Well... Point number one from verses one through five is giving in seasons of affliction. Point two, giving excellently in verses six and seven. Three is giving self-sacrificially like we'll see in verses eight and nine. And then the last point, giving in seasons of abundance in verses 10 through 15. So if you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter eight if you're not there already. Um, Paul uses an example of other Christians in another region in order to motivate the Corinthians into giving. So all of this giving is going to go towards the poor saints in Jerusalem. Um, please look at one, verse 1 through 3. Paul writes, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty 
have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. So this example of the Macedonians giving is Paul telling the Corinthians, the Corinthian church, about the grace of God among the Macedonians. He opens the chapter wanting them to know that God, what God has done, specifically through the work of the Macedonians. He makes it clear that it is God working through these people and that God gets the credit for their gift that they had given. So the work of the great wealth given by these believers was actually God working through them. So who were these people, the Macedonians? Um, If you were to look in the back of your Bible, if you have a map section, uh, you can if you want or you can take my word for it, but you would see that in Paul's missionary journeys, he travels throughout uh, the ancient world and he goes up to the north through Macedonia. Macedonia is above the region of Achaia, which is modern day Greece, but Achaia was where Corinth was. So these people to the north, And if you had a decent map and it shows all the stops in the cities that Paul stopped in, you would see he stopped in cities like Thessalonica, Berea, Philippi. We have two letters to the Thessalonians from Thessalonica and one letter to the Philippians that give us a little insight into the types of lives that these people were living. Um, You don't have to turn to to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, But here's what it says in in chapter 1, 6, and 7. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example for all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And then in chapter 2 in 1 Thessalonians, verse 14, he says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Okay, so they're suffering here, much affliction, right? And then in Philippians chapter 1, uh, 27 through 30, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So these people in Macedonia, no doubt, were facing persecution, they were suffering, uh, through much affliction. So through this severe affliction uh, and their extreme poverty, uh, these people gave. They didn't wait until their circumstances were better, but they gave to help others who were suffering. We must understand that they were not in a good position to give, financially speaking. Uh, they were being beat down, afflicted. They were received the gospel and they suffered for it. But that didn't deter them. Out of their affliction and poverty, they also had an abundance of joy, like verse 2 says, that ultimately led to that great amount of money being given on their part. And they didn't give just a little bit, but they gave according to their means and beyond their means to a point where verse 4, if you would see, they said, it says, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Um, they were begging Paul to take their money. And then verse 5, Paul says, this, is not, this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So they actually exceeded his expectation. Why? Because they wanted to give, because it gave them great joy in doing so. The Gospel Transformation Bible, uh, Study Bible, says they realize that serving Christ involves serving his servants and that serving them is, in reality, serving Christ. They gave what they had because giving was truly their pleasure. Their pleasure was in serving Christ. And serving Christ meant serving others, like it says in Matthew 25, 40. Their outside circumstances had no bearing on whether or not they would give. 
Um, if you're familiar with the author Randy Alcorn, I like, I like his book. It's called The Treasure Principle. But he says, he uh, says this about what the Macedonians giving teaches us. He says, giving isn't a luxury of the rich, but it's a privilege of the poor. They believed it to be a privilege to give, and they would not be robbed of this pleasure. Brothers and sisters, this is what we are called to. This message is not mainly about giving because you should. That's true, we know we should. But this is about the motivation behind giving. Will you want to give because it gives you great joy to meet the needs of others? The motivation behind our giving should be Christ. Why? Because, like our, bit, our main idea, it says those who have received the generosity of God's grace extend grace generously. So it's not only about giving, but giving generously. So moving to verses 6 and 7, we see that we should be giving excellently. In verse 6, he says, Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Paul urges them, as they had started at an earlier time, that they should continue to contribute. So they knew about these people in Jerusalem who were suffering, and they started to give, and now he's coming back to them, writing the second letter, saying, don't stop. Uh, And why? Just as important as faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, so is this act of grace, which is the act of giving. So as we grow in our spiritual lives, we must remember that all of our lives, that is all parts of our lives, are not off limits to God. Kent Hughes, uh, who's another preacher, he says it well. He says, we know that our lives are not our own, therefore our possessions are not our own. You cannot fully commit to the Lord without submitting your finances to the Lord. Yes, we must be faithful in the big things and know the right things about God, but we must remember to be gracious. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine about the different virtues or the uh, characteristics of the Christian and living the Christian life, and he said something, something along the lines of, if you're not intentional about that something, then you won't ever be good at that one thing. So and that is speaking to me. I must be intentional to give, and not only give, but give excellently. Okay, moving on to our point number three. We must give excellently, but we must also give self-sacrificially. I say self-sacrificially because of verses 8 and 9, but mostly 9. Listen, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. In verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Verse 9 is is really the foundation of what Paul is uh, presenting here. Our, Our main point, those who have received the generosity of God's grace extend grace generously. That is because of Christ, our ultimate example. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, And mine, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Ocean Park, this is our motivation in not only giving our money, but it's our motivation in extending grace in every part of our our lives, like we talked about in in Sunday school this morning. Um, Whoever is in our lives, we should extend that grace to them, because Christ had left heaven for you and for me. Uh, We sing the song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And um, we haven't sang it in a while, but maybe in the future. Hint, hint, wink, wink to Scott and Jenny. Um, But I like the first few lines. It says, Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Christ took on flesh 
as, and as Paul says in chapter 5, verse 21, he said, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, what, what a good definition of grace this is, and, and it's the whole reason we are to give. We don't give because we think that God will like us a little more or because we will get a little more grace from him like other religions believe. We give because of Christ and we give because we love him and want to please him. And we give because we have received so much from God and we want to extend that grace outwardly through our lives so that God works through us as his agents of grace. The reason the Macedonians could give beyond their means was because they received grace. They were some of the richest people on the planet, spiritually speaking. It was no big deal to give what was in their hands. And they teach us that deep gratitude overflows and expresses itself in deep generosity. Deep gratitude overflows in deep generosity. We talked about Acts chapter 2 verse 46 last Sunday in Sunday school. And um, I didn't think about it until Pastor Chris had said it, but uh, verse 46 says, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They weren't worried about where their next meal was coming from, and they freely gave to to any who had need. They were generous because they had received so much. This means that we must know where our help is needed. How can we meet a need of a fellow brother or sister? Uh, I think our church does pretty well. A few months ago, one of our members was without a paycheck for a time due to the government being shut down. Uh, But there was multiple people in this church who gave to them uh, financially, and they gave gave very well to them because they saw their need and wanted so desperately to meet that need of their fellow Christian. Uh, It was a great example of a community striving together to meet the needs of a fellow brother and sister because serving others is serving Christ. We must be faithful to be on the lookout for these needs that arise, and we must desire to meet those needs. Uh, The children's home in Haiti is another example that I thought of, um, and that's a ministry that this church gives to. Uh, Mike and Bonnie Snyder are down there, and they are being a father and a mother to dozens of orphans in Haiti. And in the middle of a country that has a very unstable government like we saw last month, um, they are in constant need of our prayers, but they're in need of our finances to meet those basic requirements of living in a country like that and feeding and housing 50 plus orphans, right? So this brings us to our final point in verses uh, 10 through 15. We must be willing to give in seasons of abundance. Verse 10. In this matter I give my judgment or opinion. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. Let us not be slack in giving. Let us not grow lazy in seeking needs to meet. Always be on the lookout. Paul gives us opinion, his opinion that the Corinthians give more because in doing so, it will make them more like Christ. He says that it benefits you. In verse 12, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Of course, there's not a specific amount to give in a scenario like this, but let us give proportionately according to what, he, to what we have. In verse 13, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. As a family is there to help each other um, and to help us when we need it, like a, likewise we are here to help them when they need it. Uh, Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Uh, From Exodus 16, like uh, Jim read for us. Just like the Israelites were collecting the manna in the wilderness, they had no need to collect more than that which was needed. 
And likewise, we should not hoard the things of this life, but rather we should be conduits of grace, like Pastor Chris says. Why? Because those who have received the generosity of God's grace extend grace generously. So as we close, we reflect on this great example of God's grace being poured out in the generous offering of these poor believers in Macedonia. Paul encourages the Corinthians, and God is encouraging us to do the same. This text isn't mainly about tithing. We should tithe first, yes, Miss Jenny, <laughs> like we talked about, yes. But rather, it's about seeing that need and being faithful to meet it, that need in a generous, willful contribution of the heart. A love offering, correct. And that's because we, that is what we desire, and that is what gives us joy. Um, obviously, this was a sermon and a, a message for the church and for the believers. But if you're here this morning and not a believer, then hopefully this message has caused you to see the true nature of Christ that was seen and felt through the actions of his people. Something that is so unnatural and otherworldly and foolish in the eyes of the world. I pray that you would see Christ and be moved to repent and believe that you have fallen massively short of any religious standards and that you need his grace and mercy and forgiveness for salvation. To the nominal Christian who may not think about Jesus apart from Sunday mornings, this is now the time to commit to God and submit fully to his lordship in all areas of our lives. He's not just the God who saves you from sin, but he is the God of our wallets, the God of our bank accounts, the God of our time, and he is worthy of our affections through every area of life. And to the faithful, we are to excel in all things, like it says in verse 7. But I want you to take a quick look at chapter 9, um, starting at verse 9 in chapter 9. He talks about the man of Psalm 112, the one who fears the Lord and who the Lord has made righteous. It says, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He uses us and what he has given us to meet the needs of others. Why? And I like verse 11. It says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The reason he has given us so much is that we would be generous to those around us. He has put you and I here to be burden lifters and to ease suffering, to be grace givers and to excel in Christ's likeness. And I pray, hopefully, that when people see us, um, members of Ocean Park, that they would see Christ in us and that we would uh, just be dripping with grace.